our next section is direct marketing strategies. And the reason that I picked to talk to this is that this is probably one of the most popular ways to market your goods, especially for a small business these days. And um, it was a pleasant surprise to me. Like I mentioned, a number of years ago, I started working with farmers on direct marketing, so farmers markets, community-supported ag programs, all these types of things. And local was, was um, how should I say, um, important then, and there was a lot of people buying locally, but now it's just crazy. It's just taken off amazingly, which is, um, like I said, I'm pleasantly surprised and happy. Um, it's kept me in a job, I think, partially. <laughs> University wants to hire people who are doing work that um, is useful. And um, it's, it's just amazing where it's gone. Um, there's a lot of different types of direct marketing alternatives. These are probably the five main ones. And the ones that I'm most familiar with are farmers markets, CSA programs and restaurants. And so I want to talk to you about those and we'll look at the disadvantages and advantages of, of them. And people usually start off in one and maybe move to another. I tend to see and sometimes one replaces another in their business and um, they expand and, and change things up a bit. You don't always just pick a farmer's market and stick with that for 30 years. Okay, usually you expand and change things over time. And um, why do people direct market? I think probably the number one reason is more control over where your products are going, who you're selling to, um, and also the ability to perhaps provide more profit to your farm business rather than having it go to a middleman or something like that. Um, I have this, and it's kind of hard to read this chart, um, but I like it because basically it shows that out of every dollar, that pink line that people spend on food, only um, the green line or the blue line goes to the farmer. Okay, everything in between up to the yellow line goes to what we call the marketing bill, which is transportation, packaging, all these types of things. And so if you incorporate that marketing into your own business, then you're the one that's receiving the dollar for that marketing, not someone else, okay? But what is something that you ought, if you start doing more yourself, okay, you have to realize that it's gonna be time consuming. You might not have the skills, you might have to hire someone. And so, you know, there's benefits, but there's also uh, issues that have to be overcome. The next one, and I mentioned this already, is that people are crazy about local foods now, and not everyone, okay? It's definitely a target market, but it's a growing larger target market. And there's a number of reasons for this. I think a lot of it has to do with food safety concerns, wanting to support their local community, all these types of things that kind of happened at one, once. And one of the um, interesting things is that despite our kind of downturn in our economy for the last, well, maybe more like three or four years now, we haven't seen a drop off in farmers market sales or anything like that. In fact, um, the number of farmers markets is up 65% since 2004. And also, CSAs um, went from 60 in 1990 to 3,300 in 2010. So a lot of, um, of change there. We did a study in Nevada where we surveyed 669 consumers uh, in 12 markets, 12 farmers markets across Nevada. Um, this was a grant-funded um, kind of marketing research project. And we asked people, we did this kind of um, payment card Thing where we kind of try to find out what people would be willing to pay for various fruit and vegetable products if it had a Nevada grown label on it. And you get, we have Utah Zone here, so that's what I'm getting at. And as you can see, the um, premiums that they were willing to pay for something where they knew was uh, locally grown ranged from 21% to 137%. So, um, and so there was quite a bit of premium in there um, for the locally grown products. The first one I want to talk to you is farmer's markets. How many of you have uh, sold product at a farmer's market? Okay, a few of you. How many have shopped at a farmer's market? Okay. Um, why did you shop there? Your local, fresh local food. Why else? Bread. Socialization, a place, something to do. Yes, people love to go to farmer's markets to socialize, and that's one of the major components of farmer's markets that... Um, why they, they do that versus doing something else like going to a, that joining a CSA and those types of things. So, um, so for, for producers, some of the advantages and challenges are the travel time and transportation to the market. Okay, you have to perhaps drive two, three, four hours to get to the market. Um, you have to have the transportation uh, facilities, so trucks, refrigeration to transport your products there. Um, and you have to be there at a certain time, okay? 
So if it starts at 8 in the morning, you might have to leave the house at 3, okay, in order to get there. So there's that. And it, this could be a bad or a, thing to, or a good thing depending on, on who you are and what types of resources that you have. You have to have people to work the market, okay, either yourself, family member, um, college student, intern, whatever it is. So you have to pay for labor for the market. You have to interact with customers on a one-to-one -one basis. And some people love to do this, and some people do not like to do this. <laughs> um, it's not something that happens very often, but one time I went to a farmer's market, and they had out um, just, just kind of onions, and I was asking about where they came from and, and what type they were and all this. And the guy looked at me, and he's like, you know, I'm kind of busy right now. And he was on his phone. And this was the farmer, you know? <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't his son or, you know, and I was kind of like, yeah, maybe farmer's market isn't the best. You could have the best product in the world, but maybe farmer's market is not the best place for you, you know? And I, you know, I didn't say that, but I, maybe I could have done him a favor by saying that, but anyway. So depending on who you are, this could be good or bad. Advertising and promotion is usually done by the market or the market manager, so that's, you don't have to worry about that, and that's not an expense that you incur, so that could be a positive thing. Um, you have to be there at a set day and time, and what usually happens initially is that people get really involved in farmers' markets, and then they're doing 10 and 12 of them a week, and they just get run, run ragged after a couple of summers of doing that. So they start coming up with other ideas, and that's kind of where some of these other things came in that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, you don't know what, how much you're going to sell, and the pricing is a little uncertain, okay? And so that's kind of, again, you grow it, um, you harvest it, and then you sell it, okay? And that seems pretty normal, but that's actually a disadvantage because you don't know what your revenues are going to be. You don't know how much you're going to sell. Um, you have to take out an operating loan, perhaps, from the bank um, in this situation, whereas some other types of direct marketing opportunities, um, you actually get paid ahead of time, and so that can be an advantage for, for those. Um, and you have to have a variety of products. Um, if you go to the farmer's markets, most of the time they have five, eight, ten products. They have a lot of different products. And that's because even though people are there to socialize and to um, see different vendors and stuff, you really, it's really difficult to have to go to like 20 different vendors just to get kind of a broad range of things. And so variety is really important. Consumers go to farmer's markets because they want um, fresh, a variety of local products. Um, a lot of them um, have environmental reasons. They think they're reducing food miles. They want to support local ag. And they want to socialize and go to a community event. They see their friends there every week, that type of thing. Um, and that study I mentioned earlier where we uh, surveyed people at 12 different farmers markets, basically we were able to come up with two major types of consumer groups that go to farmers markets. And then I gave them names. One was what we called the organic and health enthusiasts, and the other one was the homegrown enthusiasts. And Basically, this organic and health enthusiast was willing to pay huge premiums for organic foods. Okay? That was what was important to them. They were eating 70% of their meals at home, so in the average American eats about 54% of their meals at home, and so they were doing quite a bit more cooking at home. Um, diet and exercise was a part. They exercised on a regular basis. Um, they were really concerned with food safety, and they had high education levels. Okay? So this is the type of cons one of the types of consumers who goes to farmer's market. Um, if we wanted to um, sell to them, obviously if you have organic production standards or you're certified organic, you want to make sure they know that. You put that on your website, on all your products, that type of thing. That is very important to them. And also they're doing um, food prep at home, so uh, nutritional things, um, recipes, that type of thing um, can help with them. The next one is um, what I call the homegrown enthusiasts because they had very different reasons why they were there. Um, and it was more about supporting local agriculture. It was more about um, um, the aesthetics of, of, of buying locally. It was less about food safety and organic concerns. They were really not willing to pay too many premiums for organic produce. They eat 90% of their meals at home. That's a lot. <laughs> they do a lot of um, home meal prep. Um, they had more children in the household than the other group. They did home gardening, canning. They were really involved in home food production. And so one of the great ways to promote at a farmer's market to them is to provide um, growing information. And just because they're growing tomatoes means they, doesn't mean they won't buy from you. OK, so don't worry about that. Anything you can help them in their canning, and their uh, preserving, recipes, wine pairing, cheese pairing, all those types of things, and then tell the farm story. 
pictures, pictures of your farm, pictures of your family on everything. That's what I was getting at earlier about really promoting that family farm, where you're located, have a little map on your brochure. Yeah, we're 70 miles away, that type of thing. Um, and then I have a list of suggestions here, and I'm not going to go through every one of them and because it, it's in your handout. And this was given me to, uh, by Kim Salen, who runs the Salt Lake, downtown Salt Lake Farmer's Market. Um, but she basically suggested that if you're going to sell the farmer's market, you want to make sure you have an attractive booth, you use effective signage, your um, staff is well trained, they know all about your production processes, about your farm, um, they're um, uh, friendly <laughs> with customers, um, that if you have a brand and you can have everyone wear the same shirt with your logo on and create a brand identity so people can see you across the market and find you, um, and then of course sell a variety of high quality products. Um, so these were some suggestions she had for an attractive booth. Um, signage, I think, is one of the biggest things I know when I go to a farmer's market and I can't really figure out you know, what variety is or what the price is. I get really frustrated, and if there's, especially if there's people there and I have to really look, then I get, and I move on to the next booth. Okay, so signage. Another thing, and I don't know if it's here, is to um, work to help people as they come up. Okay, that's kind of frustrating at farmer's market if you go up and you're kind of waiting to be helped, and then three people come after you, and then they get helped before you. So you kind of have to manage the crowd a little bit. Um, this is a, a nice booth here. It's kind of hard to see with the light out here. Um, have good signage, show pricing. If you're um, involved with Utah Zone, you want to make sure you have that's noticeable or something like that. Um, your staff, uh, friendly faces, name tags and uniforms. Brand identity, tell your story. What's your name, where are you from, that type of thing. Build return customers. Get to know your customers by name. I think that's a big one. Because then, pe then people think that you value them, that you're investing them because you've learned their name. Techniques, these are some good ones here. Say, see you next week, okay? Tell them about things you're gonna have next week. So they'll say, oh, you know, that sounds really good. And they come back next week and know that you're gonna have um, fresh peaches that week or whatever the case is. Um, a newsletter mailing list or an email list so you can um, have them sign up, have a sign up sheet at your booth so that you can email them weekly and let them know what you're gonna have available, specials. And invite them, if you can, invite them out to your farm or ranch so that they can take a tour and those types of things. So that's farmer's market. Any questions before I talk about CSAs? Okay. Um, anybody belong to a community supported ag program? Me? You? <laughs> anybody sell through one, sell product through a community supported ag program? Yay! Okay, one. <laughs> okay, these are becoming really, really popular. And it's because that they're kind of like being involved with farmers markets, but they have a lot of advantages, I, at least in my opinion, um, over farmers markets for producers. Um, basically, what a CSA is, is it could be a, a one farmer or a group of farmers get together, and then they provide a, a weekly basket or box of produce, and it, or it could be meats, it could be cheeses, it just depends on, on what the CSA is, is focusing on, to customers throughout a season. Okay, so if I sign up to be a shareholder, okay, then I get my weekly basket on Wednesday evening or Tuesday afternoon or whenever it is, and I go and I pick it up, okay? And I pay ahead, okay? I might pay, in this area, probably three or $400 for four months, okay? Um, in Reno, I paid $900 for eight months, okay? So, you know, and usually it's about 32, between 25 and $45 a week on average, okay? And, and so um, one of the things about that is that you're signing up before the season, okay? And so you're, the customer is really sharing the risk with the farmer on what's going to be available, when, and how much, okay? If you have a really great year, they might get tons of stuff. If there's some weather issues that year or some pest issues that year, they might get a little less. And they know that going in, okay? Um, they also have a good idea of... Um, you know, when things are coming on and what's available and they don't expect you to give them a product that's not going to be available until the end of August and May, okay? So they're, they're educated about that. Um, so some of the advantages are is that basically the marketing and the communication with, um, or the sales, we say, is actually done before the season, okay? People sign up ahead of time usually. Um, 
Uh, they usually pay in advance, okay? So that means you have operating capital throughout the season to do your growing and harvesting and those types of things. So you wouldn't necessarily need an, oper an operating loan from the bank, okay? You develop a relationship with a customer because you're probably meeting them that at the pickup location or you're sending them um, emails or newsletters and those types of things. But it's not that one-on-one -on -one constantly like, like you'd have at the farmer's market, okay? So it's less demanding with that. Um, and then um, usually what people do is they do farmer's markets and farm stands initially, and then they gradually move into the CSA after they've made those connections with those consumers. Okay? And so we see that a lot. Um, there um, is a grower over in um, Nevada. He was doing, I think, 12 farmer's markets a week. Okay? Now he does this many farmers markets, okay? He's the primary farmer for that 400 member CSA in Reno that I mentioned earlier. He's making lots of money. He's not having to get up at three o'clock to drive, um, you know, that type of thing. Um, and so that's that we see that kind of trend, but um, some people really like that interaction and discussion with their, their customers all the time. And so they stick with the farmers markets to a certain extent, even if they have a CSA. Some of the challenges, you have to have um, quite a few crops, okay, because you want to try and give people a variety, okay, each week, and that's hard to do. Um, so you often see CSAs that have multiple farmers. They might have as many as 10 and maybe as few as two, okay, because then you have things coming on at different times because your farm probably isn't located in the exact same place. You can offer more variety, that type of thing. Um, you have to have some kind of administration with your shareholders, okay? They have to pay, you have to have online payment or send in checks, um, there has to be communication. And so a lot of CSAs, especially if they get above 100 people, will actually hire a manager to handle all of that. Um, there is some turnover in shareholders from year to year, okay? So you might have 300 one year and the next year 280, the next year 400. How, how am I going to raise all this to give 400 people stuff, right? Okay, so, you know, that, that comes and goes. Um, need for high-quality products. Um, they want variety, so it's good to have multiple farms. You have to clean and package things. I know this, this was a, kind of an issue with people new to direct marketing is, um, you know, they, they didn't realize they needed to kind of um, clean the vegetables up and kind of package them or put them in little bags. You know, that wasn't necessarily automatic, and then people get a large basket of very unclean vegetables and that makes them nervous, okay? Um, and so there's those issues. Um, you have to let people know what's going on. You have to educate them on what's going on. So if, if the box is gonna be small this, this week because we had a pest issue or it rained and messed things up, okay? Um, you need to communicate with them and let them know that that's going on, okay? So they don't, so their expectations. Um, also, um, several drop-up locations, is usually, especially if a large CSA, you have a lot of uh, consumers, you need to have more than one drop-off location. Um, very few CSAs actually have home delivery. Some do, and usually they just tack on a large delivery charge to actually take the box to someone's house rather than have them send a pick up. And also, if you have multiple drop-off locations, I've seen the best way that people do is they get volunteers to sit with the boxes in a location for three or four hours, and then when people come get their box, they just mark their name off. Um, and usually they get a discount on their box or they get a box for free. Um, by being a volunteer and, and, and sitting at that drop-off location. What do consumers like it? Um, again, they have availability of fresh local foods, okay? Exposure to new varieties and new things, okay? Um, and I was talking to one of you earlier, but um, I used to shop at farmer's markets a lot, and then when I started the CSAs up in Reno, I became a member of that, and we started getting all these things I'd never seen before. Okay, what do you do with them? Um, Lucky, my husband likes to um, likes to cook and he likes to experiment, and so he loved having these strange varieties and things we'd never seen before. I wasn't as excited about it. Okay, so that's the type of customer that's normally to CSA. They're willing to take what you give them. Um, you know, they find it to be a game, or they want to. Um, um, I don't know what's the best word for this. Uh, you know, it's a. It, they like to be able to use things that are new to them and experiment. Um, so people who go to farmers markets, they want to pick out exactly what they're looking for, and if they don't, they don't want to be a CSA member because they want certain things and they don't want to try try new things. You kind of see that difference in in people who stay at farmers markets and people who join CSAs and those types of things. Okay, um, we did a number of surveys with um, CSA members, and basically found that they tend to be highly educated. 
Um, they work more full time than our farmers market shoppers did. Okay, and more like instead of working, um, I think it was full time 40%. They actually worked full time 70%. And so again, these people don't necessarily have the time to go to a farmer's market and shop, and that's another reason they join a CSA so that they just go pick up their box and they're out of there, right? It's quick transaction. Um, they do um, more home food prep than the average farmer's market shopper. And again, remember those homegrown people? They were doing 90%, okay? They don't necessarily do 90% of their meals at home, but the average was, for the whole entire farmer's market sample was like, um, 65% or something like that. They, they do more home prep than that. Um, food quality is important. Their biggest thing is they want to support local farmers and local was more important. Um, organic was not as important with them as it was to um, those organic people from the farmer's market survey. Um, we saw a lot of vegetarians in this group, more so than in the farmer's market group. They tend to be vegetarian. Um, variety and appearance is less important to them. So like I said, they're willing to use what's in their box. Um, and they're willing to take things um, that maybe not are not as shiny and, and those types of things. Like they're just um, willing to work with what's given to them. And as I mentioned, organics less important. Some suggestions um, if you're going to do a CSA, provide recipes uh, with your share baskets, especially if you're giving someone something that is really uncommon, like they would never see in a grocery store. It's really good to have ideas on how to prepare it, um, what to do with it. Um, whole cooking demonstrations. Uh, provide educational in, uh, information such as gardening, food preserving. Um, allow people to actually pack their own share so that they can choose from what's available. Now this is less common, but it's um, actually becoming more common. Um, include a weekly newsletter that talks about seasonality, weather, pest issues, and uh, if you're up for it, home delivery service. Questions about CSAs? And Ruby should be here momentarily. I've got like two more minutes. So I'm going to talk about um, restaurants. Anybody sell to restaurants? Yeah, the back. There is. There is. There are several. Um, there are several small ones, um, ranging from about five to 20 customers. Um, I'm a member of the USU Student Organic Farm CSA, and they have about, I want to say, 50 members. Um, a lot of USU faculty and students. Um, and there are probably, Utah's own has a directory of all the CSAs and farmers markets in Utah. And so you can find out who, who's doing what, um, where they're located, um, what seasons they provide um, their products, and those types of things. Anything else? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, she mentioned something important, um, breads. That is a popular addition to a CSA basket. Also, um, salsa, jams, jellies, um, uh, fruit breads. Um, you see those get added to baskets a lot. Um, and so that's a, another thing that, um, you know, if you're growing fruits and vegetables and selling them, but you have extra at the end of the season, those value-added products you can sell all year long, okay? You can add them to baskets. Um, you know, it's very useful. Sometimes you might add on a local um, dairyman or someone to provide a cheese product for the CSA. I mean, it's, you can kind of do with what you want. Um, I mean, the standards, fruits and vegetables and greens, those types of things, but you can really do a CSA whatever you want. Um, I've seen cheese-only CSAs. I've seen meat-only CSAs. It just really depends on, on what you're doing. Okay. Restaurants. Um, Anyone sell directly to restaurants right now? 
Does that seem intriguing to sell to restaurants? Yeah, it is. It's really difficult. Um, we started a program in Las Vegas about eight years ago where we were um, looking to have high-end restaurants in Las Vegas purchased from local growers. And so we started approaching chefs about in the Las Vegas area. Um, their first response was, can you grow anything here? <laughs> Las Vegas is pretty arid. Um, the answer is yes. And in northern Nevada, uh, the answer was especially yes. Um, although our area actually included uh, growers in Utah and in Arizona because they were within a couple hundred miles of Las Vegas. And so um, we started working with uh, one chef we hired um, to help us with the project. And chefs all know each other and talk to each other. And so he was essential in getting this, pro in getting this project going. And we went from you know, zero um, people selling uh, to local chefs to 38 um, growers, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it is a lot. It was most of the growers anywhere close to Las Vegas um, selling to the high-end chefs in Las Vegas after about four years. It took us a while to get this started. So what I've given you are kind of some insights and some hints on how you might approach this market if you're interested. Um, some things about chefs um, and how they operate and that type of thing. Um, when I talk about fine dining or high-end restaurants, I'm talking about $150 for, say, two people to have a nice sit-down dinner. Um, without you know any extras added on dessert, um, wine, whatever. Okay, so it is quite spendy. Um, our, um, funny enough, um, um, it was actually the Batali restaurants in Las Vegas who are our, who ended up being our best clients. Um, and he really got into he's very much into green and these extra things. But anyway, so um, basically, um, they are looking. These chefs are looking for um, high end. Um, products, specialty varieties, heirlooms, things that are different, okay? And why would they buy from a local grower versus their kind of traditional provider? It's because they get too much um, quantity, not enough quality, they have to throw things away, and they don't like to do that. And so they really want to bring in local stuff when they can. Plus, um, chefs, and I'm not trying to be mean, but they're very egotistical. They want the best. If they have something that their friend and then this, if this restaurant next door can't get, that makes them happy. Okay, um, <laughs> they are very like, oh, I have you know these local tomatoes that you can't get because they're out. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, they, that's how they and you know, like I said, it's not necessarily a bad thing. They're just really they pride themselves on having something unique that nobody else can get. And the best way to do that is to buy from a local grower. Okay. Um, they can be very reliable customer base. Um, they do move around a bit, though, okay, from restaurant to restaurant, and so sometimes that interrupts your market. You might have to reestablish a relationship with a different restaurant because the chef you are working with moved. So there are some issues, and they are very open about telling you what they'd like to see in the future. So they're they're great for a market because they tell you exactly what they're looking for. And say, can you plant this next year for me? Oh, sure. You know, I mean, they're they're very verbal in what they want. Um, they um, are very busy people, okay? And so in a couple of slides, you'll see that um, I mentioned that you've got to contact them when they want to be contacted. Um, you don't ever go into the restaurant to talk to them or call them or whatever during meal serving hours or prep time hours. It needs to be at a separate time. Um, they love samples. If you take something in, they're going to grab a knife and cut it open and, and eat it right there, um, unprepared, whatever. They, that's the, they're a big fan of that, and once they like it, then they'll start buying from you. Snips. Providing free samples or taking samples in is probably the number one way to market to chefs. Um, when dealing with restaurants, some things that come up um, are that sometimes you, you have to spend some time figuring out who makes the decisions. Is it the restaurant owner? Is it the chef if they're a separate person? Is it the accounting department well, that would only allow the chef to buy from someone who has a vendor number? <laughs> okay. I mean, these are some obstacles and things and things you have to figure out by doing a little bit of research. And we ran into that a lot in Las Vegas because a lot of these um, restaurants were within a larger casino or a larger building. And sometimes the chefs had complete control over who they bought from. And sometimes they had to clear all this paperwork with their accounting department. It really depended. Um, um, Any time that you're doing something near a large um, urban area, like for here we have Salt Lake, very large urban area, um, restaurants can be a great market, um, but they are very hard to get into. Um, and you have to make sure that you have a good quality product, okay? That when you say you're going to have something, and you know, because they might they might change their menu just for your product for that night, 
if you're not going to be able to deliver it, you have to know, let them know as soon as possible. Otherwise, you can burn the bridge pretty quickly there. So um, again, this is a great market. What else should I mention? Bring in samples. Um, what else? Any questions about um, selling to chefs in high-end restaurants? Um, one thing that came up is um, even in Las Vegas, they got a lot of requests from their people for local stuff, even though for that client or that customer, it, it wasn't local for them because they might have been from Michigan or Ohio or someplace like that. But they were still asking, do you have stuff grown locally in this area, that type of thing. They got a lot of requests for that, even in, a, in, a, in an area that has a lot of tourists, high entertainment. And they get, they're getting that more and more, especially in the higher end restaurants. They're getting more requests for local. So um, also keeping, um, the serving staff aware of where your farm is, what you grow, what you do special can be an important part of um, selling to restaurants. Yeah. How does pricing work? Um, the pricing is much higher. Um, they usually will tell you what they're get, what they're paying from a current vendor, and then they'll mention what they like about their current vendor or don't like about their current vendor, and then you'll negotiate. Unfortunately, with the chefs, you're negotiating on almost every sale, okay? Um, so you, that's one of the, the, I guess one of the downsides is that constant negotiation. I mean, if they agree to buy greens from you, you know, every week for six weeks, you know, that's a one-time sale. So you don't have to renegotiate every week. But every time you introduce them to a new product or, or to something different, you're kind of doing that negotiation. Um, there is a website called Chefs Collaborative, and I've got their um, uh, URL down um, on, the, on the notes that I passed out. And they sell all over the country, and they have pricing there and doing some background research on, on what chefs are paying for the product that you have elsewhere is really helpful in your negotiation. Um, also, if they're asking you to grow something, kind of getting an idea of what they'd pay for it in advance is probably a good idea because they're not going to tell you after you've grown it that, oh, I'm not going to pay you that. They're usually very um, straightforward. Um, you know. um, again, they're trying to provide the best quality and, and have um, you know, good presentation um, with their meals and everything. Pricing is not, is not all that important to them. Uh, they do have some restrictions, of course, but um, and they're, if they're part of a chain of some type or part of a larger enterprise, they might be somewhat restricted in what they can pay. Um, but a lot of them usually have a lot of flexibility on pricing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's a great thing. When we started the project in Las Vegas, we gave them comment cards. We'd taken a product and we gave them comment cards, you know, freshness, taste, color, you know, and had them rate the products and what they would pay for it um, for research, really. Um, and they were all more than willing and happy to do that. Um, and then if they have something that they had to have, boy, they would buy someone out, you know. Um, we had a fruit grower um, in Arizona that had I don't know how many pounds of something and he was out that week because the chefs were like, ooh. And then they told all their friends because they all know each other and then they, they bought this guy out in a matter of days. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a chef and owner of a small restaurant in Reno that I saw at a farmer's market one day. And so we went to that restaurant that night because I wanted to see what she had done <laughs> with what she bought because it was kind of abstract. It was kind of some kind of leafy green. And then she put lentils on top of it, and it was fabulous. So um, 
anyway, great market, wonderful people to work with, very busy, a um, little stressed out. Um, but anyway, um, it's hard to get into, and I think a lot of us find that market um, a little bit apprehensive because of all the communication needs and, and, and that type of thing. Anyway, Ruby should be here momentarily. She had to teach a class, um, and then it's a little bit of a walk there. So, yes, Paul. Um, we can do an activity um, on page 68. Um, there's a market assessment. So that would be in the back of your handouts. Page 68, worksheet 2.2, current market assessment. So on this one, if you have a product in mind, um, it says product or service, you just list it there. And then um, it asks you to think about, um, well, there's room for three different markets, but let's just do one. One's hard enough, let alone three, about a market that you could sell your product to. And the first one, they, they make it easy for you. They ask about numbers of customers, you know, how, how much sales you might have. And then the second part of it asks you to identify these people. Who are they? What do they look like? Where do they shop? Why do they want your product? Or why does this fulfill their need? Okay. So let's just take a couple of minutes, um, and then I'll ask for 